Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Full Bloom with myself, Heidi Brionis, and... Hey, it's John Munis. How you guys doing? We have a wonderful show for you today. I'm very excited to talk to our guest. And John, do you want to tell us a little bit about who we're talking to today? Yeah, I'd love to. So today on the program, we're going to be talking with Mark Charles. He's an independent presidential candidate. He's a dual citizen of the United States as well as the Navajo Nation. And we're going to be talking to him today about his campaign for president. I'm really looking forward to being able to talk to our first presidential candidate here and the prospects of running as an independent and what are some of those top issues of his campaign. So I'm really looking forward to this today. Let's get into it. Okay, let's bring in Mark Charles. Mark, how you doing today? Hey, yet hey John, yet hey Heidi, it's good to be with you. Yeah, it's great to have you, Mark. Uh, so, can you just tell me for for the viewers that don't know a lot about you, a little bit about yourself and kind of your background and what made you want to run, um, so that they can learn about you? Yeah, let me start just by introducing myself. So uh, traditionally, we would say yet hey, Mark Charles, you know, yeah. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. Mm. We're matrilineals of people with our identities come from our mother's mother. Now, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say translated loosely, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother is Toihiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbakedene. Then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totichitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I'm speaking to you tonight from Washington, D.C., where I live with my family. We moved here about five years ago. And Washington, D.C. is the traditional land of the Piscataway. And so I want to honor the Piscataway and thank them for the stewardship of these lands. This is the nation that lived here. They hunted here. They fished here. They raised their family here. They buried their dead here. This is the nation that lived here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And this is the nation that was removed from these lands when the District of Columbia was built up. And I just want to acknowledge them as the host people of these lands. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, moved here from to DC from the Navajo Nation where I live with my family for about 11 years. I grew up near the Navajo na Nation in a border town known as Gallup, New Mexico and uh, have been doing a lot of work over the past maybe 15, 10 to 15 years on an issue known as the Doctrine of Discovery. I actually published a book on it with my co-author, Sung Shan Ra. Our book is called Unsettling Truth, the Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. It's a series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic Church that have basically set up this system of white supremacy and it's been embedded into the foundations of our nation so much that our Declaration of Independence, which starts with the words, all men are created equal, 30 lines later refers to natives as savages. Um, it's affected our constitution. It's, it's actually been used by the Supreme Court as a legal precedent for land titles. And so this doctrine has influenced almost every American's life and most of them have never even heard of it. And so it's not just myself, there are many other native activists, native authors, native academics, who are working hard to raise the issue. In fact, I just got a letter the other day from a woman, her name is Marcella Lebeau. She's a native woman. She just turned 100 years old uh, a few months ago. And she, I met her at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum. And she is a very bright woman. She was a nurse uh, in the army in World War II. And she was asking the candidates about native issues like the Doctrine of Discovery and like um, other injustices against Native peoples. And she is a, a very smart, very sharp woman. And at 99 years old, or, uh, she was 99 years old then, she's 100 years old now, and uh, just a wonderful woman. So there's a lot of people from our Native community who are working to raise this issue of the Doctrine of Discovery more to the forefront of the national dialogue. Yeah, I, I have the Piscataway tribe in our own area. And it's one of the things that I think, frankly, as the native people of this land, they frankly get treated as if they're just another minority group. And I'd love to hear in your opinion, like 
some of the issues around the Native American community that you don't feel like have been addressed in either the Democratic or Republican, or frankly, the Green or even the Libertarian parties, which inspired you to run for uh, president so that they can earn that voice? Yeah, I did. I gave a TEDx talk probably about uh, a year and a half ago. It's called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And it goes through the history of how the doctrine of discovery gets used beginning in 1823 as the legal precedent for land titles. And that precedent and the doctrine of discovery get referenced by the Supreme Court in land title cases in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. And the justice who wrote the opinion, and in my TEDx talk, I lay this out and help people see that this is probably one of the most white supremacist opinions written in my lifetime. And that opinion was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, holding up, and again, I tell people, when your land titles are based on the notion, the legal precedent that natives are savages and do not have, have title to the land, what this does is it makes white supremacy a bipartisan value. Um, and so these are, and just the other day, in last week, um, the McGirt versus Oklahoma case came out, which declared half, the eastern half of Oklahoma state is reservation land. And it was heralded by, by many as, a, as a, a very groundbreaking Supreme Court case ruling for Native people. However, on my, my campaign made a statement about this case. I read through the entire opinion myself. We did a live stream on it. And one of the most troubling parts of that opinion is it literally states that, um, yes, the state of Oklahoma did not have the right to disestablish reservation lands but the U.S. Congress, at any point it decided to, it could break treaty with Native nations and disestablish Native lands, and there was nothing even the Supreme Court could do about it. And so, you know, we've all known, at least in Native country, we've known that the, the Congress does break tri treaty with tribes. But this was the first time I read that the court literally stated that the Congress has the authority, the right to do that, and even the court is not going to hold them accountable for those treaties. Mm. So that was a very troubling ruling. And this was just a week ago that the Supreme Court stated that. So I'd be curious in your opinion to actually create the change. Like what would the presidential office be able to do? Do you expect to solve this via an executive order? Are you looking to change the makeup of the courts? What is the end goal of why you decided to run for president to try and bring this issue up and be able to solve it. Yeah, so probably about three years, no, actually more than that, maybe five years ago, I decided to do something most Americans have never done, which is I read the Constitution cover to cover, starting with the preamble all the way to the 27th Amendment. Now, if you, most Americans think our Constitution is about equality and freedom and, you know, liberty and all these things. But if you read it, it's very shocking. First of all, um, there's no mention of women. And if you read the entire document, you will find that there are 51 gender specific male pronouns, 51 he, him, and his. Second, it starts with the words, we the people, but article one, section two, the section that defines who's covered by this constitution, who is protected by this document, A, it never mentions women, B, it specifically excludes natives, and third, it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. Yeah. As you get down to the amendments and you read the 13th Amendment, you find it doesn't actually abolish slavery. Mm -hmm. What it says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party has been duly convicted shall exist. So the 13th Amendment doesn't redefine, it doesn't, it doesn't abolish slavery, it redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. Now in my book, we have two chapters dedicated to Abraham Lincoln and how he was actually a blatant white supremacist who not only did not care about black lives, but literally committed genocide against native peoples. And you see that this amendment actually fits in perfectly with his legacy, where in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he stated that he was a blatant white supremacist. He stated he had no intention of making voters or jurors of black people allowing them to hold office or to intermarry. He did not believe the, doc the Declaration of Independence applied to them, he did not want them to become citizens. And so while he was against chattel slavery, he was very much open 
to constitutionally institutionalizing white supremacy and even protecting the institution of slavery. And that's exactly what the 13th Amendment does. And so we have, we just a few weeks ago, we released our 100 day plan, our first, our plan for the first 100 days in office. And I am proposing that we remove the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy from our constitution. I've actually gone through the constitution and I've used a strike through font to edit out all the racist, the sexist, and the white supremacist language. I'm not changing balance of powers. I'm not changing checks and balances. I'm actually making the constitution say what most people think it says. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am hoping that we, the moment after I'm inaugurated, I can present this draft of the constitution to the Congress. They can vote on it and say, yes, we want to approve this. We can then send it out to the states and actually get the constitution amended. And I would actually not even use the word amended. I want it edited. I don't want something at the end of the document that says, when you read he, we actually meant everybody. I want us to be able to read the document and know that this is inclusive language. Um, and the, the language of the constitution is actually inclusive of everybody, not just the white landowning males who wrote it. Um, and so that's our plan for the first 100 days. If you go onto our website at markcharles2020.com and go to our blog, you can actually read that draft of the constitution we have there. And you can find out how we intend in the first 100 days to do some foundation level work so that again, for the very first time, we the people might actually mean all the people. Wow, that's fascinating, Mark. That's amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you in regards to white supremacy. I mean, I think clearly, you know, we can see that the foundation of the country, you know, was laid under white supremacist, <laughs> um, you know, values and, you know, it was built into our laws, as you pointed out. Uh, how do you feel about what's currently going on as far as current events with um, white supremacy kind of seen this major resurgence um, and validation in a lot of the current events, um, both from our leaders and otherwise. How do you feel about what's currently been going on as far as white supremacy? I mean, I've noticed it, um, you know, a lot more than I have in previous years. I know that it's been there and I've been aware of it, but it seems a lot more blatant um, recently and more just out there. How do you feel about what's been, you've been seeing more recently? Yeah, even one of the reasons why I decided to run is if you go back to the 2016 election, okay, where we had Donald Trump running and his, his, his quote was, he wanted to make America great again. Hillary Clinton, who was, had become the nominee, she responded by telling her supporters that America's great already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they both agreed our past, our history, our foundations were great. They disagreed if we were great in 2016. Donald said no, <laughs> Hillary said yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. At the Democratic National Convention, President Obama jumps into the fray and says America is great already. And then Cory Booker, who was an up and coming star within the Democratic Party, he ran for president in 2020, he gets on the main stage and in his speech, he acknowledges that the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as savages. He acknowledges the Constitution excludes women, and he acknowledges the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now, this is kind of unprecedented. Most people at that level of politics do not acknowledge any of those flaws in our foundations, and he acknowledged all three of them on the very public stage of the Democratic National <coughs> Convention. But he ended that section of his speech by telling the majority white audience that these things did not detract from America's greatness. Hmm. Now, he hmm. would never say that to a room full of black people. <laughs> he would never say that to a room full of native people. He said that because he, as a black man, had to make white landowning men feel safe. <laughs> and the way you do that is you affirm the myth of American exceptionalism. And so that's what he was doing. And so even when in, in President Obama's final State of the Union, mm -hmm. he was acknowledging the divisiveness that had happened throughout in our country throughout the eight years of his presidency. Yep. And he was calling for a new politics. 
and he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people, our Constitution begins with these three simple words, words we've come to recognize mean all the people. Now, I heard him say that. He got a lot of applause for that line. He quoted the Constitution. I stopped myself and I asked, I said, when, when, Mr. President, did we decide this? The founding fathers did not believe we the people meant all the people. Abraham Lincoln did not believe we the people meant all the people. As good as the civil rights movement was, it did not get us to we the people meaning all the people. Donald Trump does not believe we the people means all the people. The challenge is, is we've never decided as a nation that we want to be a place where we the people includes everybody. And that's what my campaign is about. I'm calling the question, if you will, <laughs> and asking our, our citizens, do we want to be a nation where we the people actually includes everybody? If we do, then we have to work on our foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing my hair, and it's tied in a, in a red C8. My hair, this is called a C8, the, the Navajo bun, and it's tied in red yarn. I'm wearing it in red yarn because this is the symbol that we use in Indian country to remind ourselves of the crisis we're facing known as missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Mm -hmm. Literally hundreds, if not thousands, of our indigenous women and girls have gone missing. They've been reported missing by their families. They've been reported as maybe murdered to law enforcement. And not only in most cases have their cases never been closed, they've often never been opened. And the families are left to search for them themselves. Now, at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum I attended last August, and Bernie Sanders was there, Elizabeth Warren was there, Julian Kasha was there, Marianne Williamson was there. Most of the major Democratic candidates were there along with myself. And as they were asked about this crisis we're facing, most of them responded by saying that they would propose a new law or would suggest a new policy to protect this vulnerable demographic. But the point I make throughout my campaign is when your constitution never mentions women and your declaration refers to natives as savages, you shouldn't be surprised when your indigenous women go missing or get murdered and society doesn't care. Yeah. A new law isn't going to fix this. The problem is the basis for our laws. We want to solve this problem. We have to change our foundation. And so this is just one of the many examples. You know, we're talking right now about policing and what kind of chokeholds we should ban. And, you know, Joe Biden suggested we start shooting people in the kneecaps instead of in the chest. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and there's even some discussion on do we defund the police, which isn't just about not funding them, but changing yeah. the whole system of policing. Now, I am the only candidate in the 2020 election whose platform includes the call to abolish slavery. Mm -hmm. I want to remove the clause from the 13th Amendment. It should state neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States, period. Nothing mm -hmm. about keeping it legal in prison. Yeah. And I'm telling people, if you want to reform our criminal justice system and your reform does not begin with abolishing slavery, whatever reform you pass is not going to fix the problem because we've institutionalized white supremacy within that within that part of our government. And we have to address it there first. Hmm. So while President Trump, President Biden are debating back and forth of what ways to what chokeholds to use and where to shoot people, I'm saying let's deal with the heart of the issue, which is let's, re let's abolish slavery and remove the value for it from our constitution so that we actually have the basis of law that is about getting rid of this vile act and we can start our, ref our, our reform there. So Mark, I'd love to follow up on that and ask, you know, we can have these language changes to some of our foundational documents, but I think to have that really trickle into the culture, there has to be a transitionary period where you're at least, you know, putting the message out there why this was so needed. Because I think to get a constitutional amendment, I know you don't want it tacked on to the end, but this would be an amendment process. We're going to have to go to each and every single state to make this case. What is your plan, both campaign wise and leadership wise, of where you think this case needs to be made because you'll have to win on board around 37 states. How do you like try to target who is ready to have that conversation? Who have you been trying to campaign with so far? Where has this message resonated? Well, so this, 
This is why I'm running for president is because I decided the best way to get our nation to talk about this is to bring the message directly to the people. And so this is why I'm running for president. And this is one of the reasons I'm running as an independent because it actually gives me the chance to participate in the general election. Had I run as a Democrat, like every other person of color, I would have been removed from the stage because both the Democrats and the Republicans require their candidates to campaign first in the states of Iowa and New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Iowa is the sixth widest state in the country, New Hampshire is the fourth. <laughs> Iowa has the highest percentage of private lands. New Hampshire has the highest percentage of home ownership. Mm -hmm. Iowa has a state law requiring them to first be the first caucus state. New Hampshire has a, a state law requiring them to be the first primary state. Both the Democrats and the Republicans decided that they wanted their presidential politics to run through white landowning men. And do you know when Iowa became the first primary state? It's like right after the civil 60s. rights movement. Yeah, I was going to say the 1960s. 19, oh. 1972 was the first oh, year it became the first primary wow. state. Right after the civil rights movement, when African Americans finally gained more access to the voting booth and, and, and were more um, had more ability to participate in our dem democratic system, that's when the Democrats decided that they were going to run their primary through one of the widest states in the country. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. How would you propose changing that system? Uh, like, obviously, uh, the states have some decisions over their democratic processes. How would you try to make a reform so that it would be a more fair primary process? Uh, I, do you I, think that's I, where people just break hold of the parties and all run independent? What, what's your plan on trying yeah, that's, to... That's what I did. I, I refused to participate. I ran as an independent. And yeah. I began my campaign not to the white landowning men in Iowa, New Hampshire, but to the native nations of Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. So I actually, because I ran as an independent, I spent the first almost nine months, seven months of my campaign, campaigning in places like South Dakota and New Mexico and um, Oklahoma and um, Oregon and Minnesota, where native communities, native populations live. I went out to native nations and brought my message first to them because I deeply believe that if you want to be president of these lands that encompass Turtle Island, the most appropriate and respectful place to begin your campaign is by talking first to the native nations of Turtle Island. And so that's what I did. I just refused to participate in the system that set up white landowning men as the gatekeepers. And as a result, yes, most of the nation may not have heard of me yet, but I'm still here. I have not been removed from the stage yet. And that means we still have a chance. I have a whole lot more chance of becoming president than Cory Booker, than, than Elizabeth Warren, than Julian Castro, than Marion Williamson. Why? Because I ran outside the system and I didn't give white landowning men the opportunity to remove me from the state. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so are you in favor of us like dismantling the party system, just to go back to that a little bit, would you be in favor of everybody running as an independent? And do you think that's a more fair, um, you know, system in general? Do you feel like the parties themselves, I mean, you mentioned it already, so I'm, I, I believe that you probably do, but do you feel that the party structure itself sets itself up for, you know, things like white supremacy and favoring, um, you know, the current systemic issues that you were talking about right now? And would you be in favor of dismantling the parties entirely? And yeah, so the two party system is really established to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. It's not going to bring about drastic change and it's not going to bring about systemic change. Even right. during this last debate on white supremacy and, and policing and all this institutionalized um, racism that we have, if you listen to the rhetoric of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, so Donald Trump is complaining about getting rid of Confederate um, uh, Confederate statues and monuments. And he's like, we need to keep those up. Yeah. So Biden says, well, let's put them in the museum. <laughs> now they both agreed that we should not get rid of statues and monuments to slaveholders like George Washington. They both would be opposed to removing, removing monuments to blatant white supremacists and actually genocidal presence like Abraham Lincoln, right? So the Confederates are the low hanging fruit and they disagree on that. Okay, Donald says, leave them up. 
Joe says put them in a museum, but they both agree we can't touch these other sacred people within our history because even though they were blatant racist and purely and, and clearly white supremacists, we still hold them up as heroes within our culture, within our country. And so they, they actually both, so they don't have a lot of disagreement. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe Donald Trump is more crass and a bit more rude and less refined than Joe Biden is. <laughs> but again, the way I described it back in 2016 is we thought the 2016 election was about racism versus anti-racism, equality versus inequality. But when you have Donald Trump at that point saying America's great, make America great again. And you have the Democrats saying, no, America's great already. <laughs> but what they were debating was not equality versus inequality, racism versus anti-racism. What they were debating was, did we want Donald Trump to make our nation explicitly white supremacist, racist, and sexist? Or did we want the Democrats to work to keep our racism and, and white supremacy implicit? <laughs> and yes. that was the debate we had. And we actually voted for implicit and the Electoral College gave us explicit. So even a lot of irony there. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Well, that's <laughs> that's awesome to hear. I, I mean, just in general, your, your thoughts on that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, before we kind of see if there's any questions or anything, I did just want to know your opinion on, you know, your local football team and, you know, all of that, the name change. And yeah. I want to know your thoughts on, on that. Yes, so our native communities have been advocating for years and many people, um, Susan Harjo and many others have been advocating and asking um, the Washington football team and Dan Snyder to change the name, repeating over and over, we're not your mascot. Um, this is a dehumanizing racial slur, it's, it's not appropriate. And he, that change has been resisted for a long time. Um, when FedEx, and uh, one of the owners of FedEx actually, or the CEO of FedEx went and said, hey, we are gonna put some economic pressure on the football team to change it. This is when Dan Snyder finally crumbled. He doesn't, he hasn't gained a value for, for native lives. He saw that his decision was gonna hurt him economically and that's why he made the change. Mm -hmm. I'm glad he made the change. Mm -hmm. I am waiting to see what new name they're going to choose. Yeah. What, what would you prefer? Do you have any preference? I am not even going to voice my opinion there. I'm, let's just say I don't have a lot of hope for what Dan Snyder yeah. might decide will be the next one. I mean, the top suggestions right now that they've been debating between is the Red Tails and the Red Wolves. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I think they're not going to do a great job naming, and I think it's way overdue. So hopefully so, but, agree, at least I, something will be an improvement, even if it's still not good enough. I do want to. I do want to make sure I honor all of the people who have worked hard for years to bring this issue to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased that the name is being changed. Um, and I honor the work of the people who have fought for this change. Mm -hmm. And I'm holding my opinion until I see what name they decide to go with from here. And then we can discuss where we're at with that. But for the moment, I'm deeply grateful, not to Dan Snyder, <laughs> I, but I'm deeply grateful for the, the, the native peoples and the, and the allies who have pressed hard for this change for a long time. And I'm glad that our voices were heard. Mm, totally agree with you there. So the last question I wanna ask before we get to one of our fan questions out there is, you know, we've talked a lot about how we need to help stabilize this equality that is foundational um, and is basically rooted in white supremacy. But if, if we want to help win this election, we do still have around 60%, 70% that are white Americans currently in the electorate. What is something that you would propose as a universal solution that helps uh, the groups afflicted that you want to be able to help, but would also be benefiting some white people who you would also hope to vote for you in this campaign as well? Yeah, one of the things that I am trying to help people understand is my campaign is about decentering whiteness. So we have a nation built around the, the myth of American exceptionalism, which is rooted in the lie of white supremacy. I'm not trying to oppress white people, nor am I trying to give them a taste of their own medicine. 
but I'm adamant we need to remove white people from the center and allow them to join the chorus of voices that are along the edges or at the margins. Now, the problem is when you're used to being in the center, being moved to the sides is gonna feel oppressive even though it's not. <laughs> and so, but one of the challenges we face as a nation is that we, we literally have bought this lie of white supremacy and it's harmful not only for the people who are being oppressed, we have we understand issues like historical trauma and generational trauma that are afflicting African Americans, Native Americans, other marginalized and oppressed communities because of the history that has been we've been victimized by, that we've been hurt by. In my book, the um, Unselling Truths: The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery, we have two chapters on trauma, and one of the traumas that I I lay out in this book is called PITS. It's a perpetration-induced traumatic stress. Rachel McNair, who really did the most work on that diagnosis, she, I, she talks about it as being the, um, the, the trauma or the psychology of killing. So if you have a state-sanctioned permission to kill, what does that do to you psychologically? And she identified a trauma. Mm -hmm. She says it, it's very similar to PTSD in most regards except if PTSD afflicts the victim of the horrifying event, Pitts afflicts the perpetrator, the person who caused it. And so I theorize that yes, while we have communities of color that are victims of historical trauma and are wrestling with that in those, in those spaces, white America is also another group of traumatized people. They are not victims of trauma, they are suffering from what I would call a multi-generational and communal manifestation of a complex perpetration-induced traumatic stress. Hmm. This is from standing on years of actively oppressing people beneath them. And that has traumatized many, if not all, of the white people in our country. This is not an individual trauma. It's a communal trauma, just like historical trauma is. And this is my theory. There's no been no diagnosis or, or you know, this isn't an, uh, anything of, of that's official. But this is when I look at this and when I understand this and I, I've under, I've looked at at historical trauma, I've looked at all of these issues and I argue this out in my book of this is what I think that white America is um, wrestling with. And so what that means is that the history of this nation has not only been harmful for the people who experienced the oppression, it's actually been harmful for the people who perpetrated it. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the, the um, main planks of my platform is that the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa and Rwanda and in Canada. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call our truth and reconciliation, though, because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. And if you understand the history, that's not true. So I would call our truth and conciliation because conciliation is merely the mediation of a dispute. They both get us to a better place. It's just conciliation has a more honest starting point. Mm -hmm. There's a native leader. His name is George Erasmus. And I think he sums it up perp um, perfectly when he says, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Mm -hmm. If you want to build a community, he says you have to start by creating common memory. I think this lack of a common memory is what our nation is hurting from the most. We have a white majority that remembers this mythological history of discovery and expansion, opportunity and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color that have the lived stories of stolen lands and broken treaties, yeah. of slavery and Jim Crow laws, of boarding schools and Indian massacres, of internment camps, segregation, mass incarceration, families being ripped apart at the borders. And we have no common memory. And there's actually, if you're honest, there's no point in American history when we can look back with nostalgia and say, look at what great relationships we had across racial lines. That hasn't existed here. And so my vision is not only do I want to build a nation where we the people actually means all the people, 
I want to help create this common memory so that maybe also for the very first time, we can have healthy community here in our country. And that's going to benefit not just the marginalized people who have been pushed to the side, but that's going to benefit white America that is also dealing with trauma not because they're victims of it, because of what they have perpetrated, what they're standing on, that they have never learned how to deal with. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for answering all of our questions. We'd love to just touch on a couple that our audience has sent so far. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Jukari Davis. Jukari asks, uh, people ask, how can you pay for policies like reparations, universal basic income, Medicare for all? Uh, how do you try to respond to those types of people who say, how do we pay for these things? And are these things that you include in your platform, universal basic income, reparations, yeah, so, Medicare for all? So I've heard, um, you know, I, I was in several different forums with the Democratic candidates. So I've heard a lot of their arguments and discussions on universal basic income, Medicare for all. I would agree with Bernie Sanders. I, I would agree that health care is a right, not a privilege. Um, he has not, nor has Elizabeth Warren yet convinced me they know how to pay for it. Um, a lot of their proposals of how do they pay for these types of services is they tax billionaires, right? Now, the problem with taxing billionaires means you have to keep producing billionaires. And I don't like living in an economy that continues to produce billionaires. That type of economy is not sustainable. We cannot have that much disparity. We cannot have that much wealth concentrated in one or two people and be sustainable globally. And so we have to build an economy that makes it much, much, much harder to produce billionaires. So if we're going to if we're going to develop social programs that are dependent upon our economy continuing to produce billionaires, we're not building a sustainable economy. And so we have to look at, not only do we have to look at how do we pay for these, but how do we transform our economy so we don't have the type of disparity that we have today? And I did not hear, even Elizabeth Warren was not fully addressing that. And that's one of the questions we have to answer. I really like Andrew Yang's thinking on universal basic income. I think because as we learn how to utilize technology more, which is going to mean to more automation and more AI and more just ways of enhancing our lives with technology, that's going to reduce jobs. It's going to allow corporations to make more money and it's going to mean they have to pay less money to employees. So I like his outside the box thinking of, we have to find another way to make sure that we have an economy. And so, yes, if, if these corporations, you know, are able to use innovation in a way that reduces their need for labor, which allows them to make a ton more money, then I don't want to tax them because if you tax them, it feels like they've earned this money and they're giving some of it back. No, I want to make it harder to earn the money. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'd love to just clarify. What would you say are some of those things beyond taxation that prevents that? Like, what are some of the ways you would want to refigure the economy so that we prevent having more billionaires uh, evolve in the crew? One of the things I want to discuss about, and we've just begun talking about this in some of our policy meetings with our campaign, is what does it mean to have corporate protection? What does it mean to incorporate? You know, we hear these stories about even Donald Trump, who apparently he hasn't shown his tax returns yet, so we don't know if he's actually a billionaire, but he says he is. Yeah. And, and yet he's done this by literally driving many of his businesses into the ground going bankrupt. So he's allowed to hire people, fire people, employ these companies as shambles while he still makes money. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a fair economic system to you? Doesn't to me. Just because he was able to start with more and invested money, and then he was able to profit from literally allowing people's jobs to evaporate in front of their eyes. And yet he walks away with millions and they have to go sign up for unemployment. I think we have to look at what what changes do we need to make to incorporation to how we incorporate our businesses, not so that someone can be driven to poverty through liability, but so that they don't have the ability to enrich themselves while they drive other people to poverty. Mm, that makes sense. And so, again, 
I'm as I do with so much of the other things about our campaign is I'm trying to get our our nation to think outside the box and to shift our paradigm. You know, one of the things I've said to Bernie Sanders supporters is I, I again I agree with him that health care is a right, not a privilege. Had Bernie Sanders stayed in the race, had he been able to win the nomination instead of Joe Biden, and had he been able to defeat Donald Trump, and had he been able to pass his Medicare for all, because our system, our nation, our foundations are racist, sexist, and white supremacist, what that would have meant is white landowning men would have had great health care. And the rest of us would have had a hodgepodge. Right, because that's how all of our systems work. We have a, a group in the center that, that gets what is intended for them and everyone else gets a hodgepodge. And so while he has a good idea, but because he didn't start that idea with addressing the racism, the sexism and the white supremacy, it would not have been able to been distributed out equally. Yeah, that makes and, sense. I mean, with our healthcare system as is, the healthcare you're paying for with Medicare for all you're paying for lower quality healthcare because there's been less uh, actual like hospital investment into some of these poor areas that are both rural for white people as well as urban for minority communities as well. As well as I'm sure this has been a problem for uh, the indigenous population as well. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one of the issues. You know, even even President Obama made this mistake, and he went to the Crow Reservation, and I listened to him. And he was I wasn't there personally, but I heard his speech, and he was. He was um, talking about how great it was that they were passing Obamacare. Well, he was talking to Native peoples who have health care as a treaty right. Why should they care about what the rest of you know? Like he wasn't even acknowledging that this is not this is a treaty right for them. And so again, this is where our nation doesn't even understand so many of these things that that we've agreed to and that we just don't know how to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, I, I like the thinking, you know, I, I've said this in another, in another podcast too, um, you know, someone like Andrew Yang, I would love to have him maybe in a cabinet position or something like that, because I love his outside the box thinking. Um, I really like some of Bernie Sanders thinking on Medicare for all and what can we do to, to make sure we have some kind of universal healthcare system. Um, he hasn't convinced me he knows how to pay for it yet, but I love the way he's thinking and trying to deconstruct the systems we have. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about what would be my dream cabinet, what would be the voices I would want around the table, I think a lot of the candidates, you know, and even, even Jill Biden said this, that she agreed her husband was not the best on the issues. There were a lot of really innovative people running for, running for the Democratic yeah. nomination. Oh yeah, he is toward the back of the pack. They gave it to you know the middle of the road, most establishment guy they could find, the 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 white landowning male from the one percent. But everyone else, most of the other people on that stage, had some really innovative thinking about what they wanted to do. And I would love to gather those types of voices into my administration, so that we could have some really robust, robust debate about how do we move this country forward. Well, I love that. And I think you might have earned some some support from some uh, Yang gang members with a few of those uh, comments about uh, UBI and automation. Yeah. Mark and wins. You got a guaranteed spot yeah. there. <laughs> Andrew Yang's got a cabinet spot, sounds like. So I think that Andrew Yang supporters should uh, consider volunteering and, you know, voting for Mark Charles here. Sounds sounds like it could be a good way to go. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just want to thank Jakari for asking that question and thank you for the donation. Let's do one more before we wrap up, Mark. Okay. Last question here. This comes from Dreaming Nirvana. She asks, uh, when you become president of the United States, how will you solve 18 million people out of a job? How would you address housing shortages and foreign policies? Certainly a mouthful there, but um, do you have any general solutions of what you think can be done to help the jobless housing shortages and a general like how you try and view foreign policy for America? Yeah, well, I, I can go straight to, I'll, I'll start with foreign policy because I have that one on the tip of my tongue. One of the nominations I am most excited to make in my cabinet is I want to nominate a native person as my secretary of state. Um, I was talking earlier about the need to have a common memory. 
And the challenge is, is for most of our nation's history, we have set out as the primary ambassador of our nation, people who have a very colonial memory of these wines, of these lands. And I would love to have someone, not only to have a native, uh, myself as president, but a native as our first ambassador to the world who has an indigenous memory, a very decolonized memory of Turtle Island, and who can actually help engage conversation. You know, when we look at who are our closest allies, well, most of our closest allies are from Western Europe. Western Europe colonized most of the world, including North America. And so I would love to not only create this common memory in our own community, our own nation here, but I would love to have some very deep discussions with our allies yeah. about what are actually the common values that we have. You know, France, Germany, they were all colonial nations here in, in not only in North America, but all around the country. And I think we need to have a discussion with those nations about how do these nations now operate in what I'm hoping will become a post-colonial world. Um, and so that's one of the things I would love to, to, I'm looking forward to nominating a Native American as my Secretary of State. Um, as far as healthcare, or not healthcare, but housing, and um, people who are, are without houses here in this nation, these are overwhelming issues that we need to learn how to address. And not only do we have to have legislative answers to them, and again, as I was saying earlier, we need to create an economy that doesn't produce as many billionaires, maybe even no billionaires, we need, which means we need to have an economy that actually distributes the income and the wealth of our nation better. You know, Bernie Sanders frequently will refer to our nation as one of the richest nations in the history of the world. Well, the only way we're the richest nation in the world is if you have a very colonial understanding of wealth. We have an incredibly rich 1%. And our middle class and lower class are probably better than a lot of places in the world, but, but still, we have huge income inequality here in this nation. And so we need to address that. I mean, if the pandemic proved anything, right? We had, in uh, four months ago, we were coming off 11 years of a bull market. We were coming off of historic lows for um, unemployment. We we're coming off of, of historic highs for um, corporate profit. You would think if there was any point in American history that we could have, our economy could have handled something like a global pandemic, it would have been in February and March of 2020. And our economy collapsed in five days. Five days. Yep. And now, four months later, the upper echelons of the 1% have recouped billions and billions of dollars while many of Americans are losing their jobs, have income insecurity, have housing insecurity, have food insecurity. There's, and, and some of what we're even calling now our essential workers, we're heralding them as essential workers, but we're still paying them minimum wage. Have yeah. we learned nothing? <laughs> so again, we need an economy that produces less billionaires and has a more equal distribution of the wealth that this nation is generating. And until we learn how to do that, we are not a wealthy nation. We are a very greedy nation. We are a very hoarding nation. We are not a very wealthy nation. And so again, if we can address these things, if we can begin to change our values, then we're going to have, I think, a better opportunity to to not only culturally address some of these issues, but even legislatively address them. Absolutely. Well, well said, uh, Mark. And I've, you know, definitely enjoyed this conversation. And I know John has as well, and everybody else watching. Uh, so before before we go, just uh, how can people find out more about you, help you out? What are the things that you most need? Uh, before we say goodbye here, we definitely want to promote your campaign. I mean, I'm definitely going to look way more into you after this conversation. Yeah. And I hope I see you on the ballot in Oregon. I don't know how that works. But um, how can people find out about you, support your campaign before we say goodbye here? Yeah. So for people, 
for people who are hearing about me for the first time, I, I invite you to go to our website, markcharles2020.com, and click on our announcement video. We have a nine-minute announcement video. I've been running since May of 2019. And so we're not new to this race at all. You may not have heard of me before, but we are definitely not new. Mm -hmm. And I invite you to watch that nine-minute announcement video. To this day, it is one of our best um, campaign tools that we have because it actually offers hope. It offers vision and hope, and it completely addresses the context of what we're dealing with today. And so I invite you to watch that video, to share it. You can donate to our website. We are working hard to get on the ballot or give people the right to vote for us in as many states as possible. Due to the pandemic, our signature collection has not been what we had hoped. And so we are largely looking right now at a write-in campaign. Um, we are expecting we will be a writing cam candidate in about eight, 38 states and that we will be on the ballot in at least three states, if not 12 states. There are unfortunately nine states where people will not be able to vote for us because um, we were not able to get on the ballot and because they don't have write-in access. But in 40 states plus the District of Columbia, people should be able to vote for us. And that gives us access to almost 450 electoral college votes, which is more than what we need to win. You need 270 to win. So our campaign is viable. And if you, if you, when people talk to our campaign and say, well, a vote for you is going to be a vote for Trump, I tell them, go back and watch my video. <laughs> compare my vision to Joe Biden's. Compare my vision to Donald Trump's. And tell me who you think the best candidate is. And when you compare us with vision, when you compare us about trying to build unity instead of divisiveness, when you compare who understands with the context that we're in now, where the issues we're facing today, our campaign comes out ahead and shoulders above everybody else's. Now, the challenge is, is we're a third party, we're independent, we're not in the two party system. And the two party system has bred a lot of hopelessness. A lot of a lot of despondency about voting outside those two parties. And so I have to remind people, yes, voting for me is going to feel risky. It's going to feel risky. And you are going to be shunned by the two party system. You're going to be shunned by many people around you. But if you want to see the change we're talking about, if you want to live in a nation where we the people truly means all the people, if you want to abolish slavery, if you want to deal with these systemic problems we're dealing with, you have to vote outside the two-party system. The two-party system is not going to give you these types of changes. And so at some point, our nation has to decide it's willing to take that risk. Yes. And so I'm acknowledging for people, yes, it's going to be risky, but that's the only way we're going to get change is if people are willing to stand up and say, I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to vote for this candidate, even though he's not a part of the system, but this is how we're going to get to the change we want to get to. Thank you so much, Mark. I love it. Um, you're definitely speaking in my wheelhouse and that's exactly how I feel <laughs> at this moment. So thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sure John does as well. John, did you want to? Uh, Mark, I, I really appreciated you being here today. I really appreciate you bringing up the need for independence. And, you know, you call it third party, but I really think this is no party. And this means you're beholden to no one. You're only beholden to the people out there. So I really want to thank you for raising an independent campaign. And I do hope people will check out your vision statement, as you said, at markcharles2020.com. We got that scrolling across the bottom of the page. But thank you so much for being here. I want to remind people one more thing. Our first white president was an independent. Mm -hmm. We did not have parties when George Washington ran. Yep. So yep. there's no reason our first native president can't also be an independent. <laughs> I love it. I love it, Mark. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great to be with you. Have a great night. Good night. Bye, Mark. Okay, so that was wonderful. It was a pleasure being able to talk with Mark Charles. Uh, Heidi, did you have any lessons that you took away from that conversation that you want as your final thoughts? Ooh, I mean, so many. I mean, that got very deep and real and things that I've thought about and felt um, so many times in my life um, from growing up as a child. And I'm hearing the mythology of, you know, American exceptionalism and white supremacy. And even as a child being like, 
this doesn't seem right. You know, yeah. there's something off about the story that they're telling me about how great all these people were. I'm not, I wasn't really buying it, you know, as a, as a small child. Um, and then growing up, seeing the realities of the situation, and then now seeing it kind of, you know, just exemplified, just sort of in theater. Oh, yeah. um, when I mean, history is written by the victors. Uh, this is when yeah. white people are conquerors, white people are also the historians. And so some of that time gets clouded. And so I really do appreciate that big yeah. gravitas that he's bringing of like this true reckoning of we have to heal racial divisions. It's more than just reparations. It's a a full foundational conversation that needs to be had. So I really appreciated that. Um, so yeah, that was great. With, yeah, with that being said, let's let's tell you a quick uh, summary of what we got going on this week. Uh, so we just had yesterday our interview with Michael Beardsley. Tomorrow we're getting back to the down ballot candidates again. We're going to be having Eva Putzova on the program at 9 p.m. Eastern time. She's from Arizona's first mm -hmm. district. Then we're going to be having another full bloom episode. This will be a little bit different. We're focusing on you, the audience. We're doing an Ask Me Anything. It's gonna be my <laughs> birthday. Uh, and you know, we're gonna make it a little bit more fun because it is my birthday. For the Ask Me Anything, you can ask questions to both Heidi and I, but if you get a question that I refuse to answer or if I say it depends, I'll be taking a shot for that. And if you guys are really struggling, we'll be having a, a charity that we'll be doing a little fundraising for that day. And if we hit certain thresholds, I'll also be drinking to celebrate the evening. And then finally, we're gonna be closing off the week with Sarah Gadd, another congressional candidate in Illinois' first congressional district. So we got a jam packed week ahead. So please guys, see you again at 9 p.m. Yes, like, subscribe, comment, do all the things that you do. And we love you here at Full Bloom and the Hill of Roses. And I'll say it today, you guys, you guys stay rosy out there, all right? Yeah, love you all.